Hope everyone's doing well. I have a feeling you probably know what today's sermon is going to be about. I um, want to welcome you to Faith Bible Church. We're excited to have you worshiping with us. And yes, we are in Malachi chapter 3. We're going to be looking at verses 6 through 18, and we're going to be talking about tithing. Um, thought that we would start off with a little bit of humor, maybe um, encourage some of you to take a look at that. Uh, start off light, but then also we're going to kind of dive into today's topic. Uh, the first thing that I'd like to say before I really get into the scripture and get into the word is um, we are fine. So the first thing that I want everybody to know is this is not a sermon that's designed for specifically today because the church doesn't have funds. Um, we want to thank all of you. We are very blessed. Uh, right now, we are essentially behind our budget, but we are ahead of expenses. So this is not a manipulative tool. This isn't something that I've snuck in, for lack of a better word, at the end of the year to kind of say, hey, let's bolster this, or we need more money. This is just part of Malachi, what we've been going through. And what we're discovering in the book of Malachi is the prophet has come forward to the people of God in and around 460, 450 BC. And the people of God are essentially upset with him. And they're saying, God, how have you loved us? What we've learned and what we've seen is God has essentially brought his people back from exile. He's established them back in their land and given them many blessings. But the people of God are looking and they're saying, this isn't enough. We want more. We demand more. And in that, in wanting more, they begin to say, God, you're not loving us. Now, interestingly enough, sometimes in our world, we can get to a point where we have an expectation of God to give us what we want, when we want, and how we want it. We essentially view God as a genie in a bottle. And what we need to remember is God has provided and God has loved for us in a variety of different ways. And we've gone through and we've talked about how God has given us his best. And in that, it should move our hearts to want to give our best to God. We've also discovered that Malachi comes forward and essentially the foundation that God has isn't that he's saying, well, I'm upset with you. And then the people of God say, well, why are you upset? And God just says, I don't know, I'm just irritated. I don't really have any factual data. I'm just kind of emotional right now and, and, and you're just bothering me, so I'm mad. No, God lays out specifically why he is upset with his people, but he does so in a loving and encouraging way. He says, look, these are the issues. I'm going to confront you with what's going on with your heart, but I'm also going to remind you that I'm here and I care. And obviously, as we've seen in the beginning, I have loved you. I want to show you how I have provided for you. I'm going to confront you in the issues that are at hand, but I'm also going to tell you that I will continue to love you. However, because your hearts are far from me, our relationship is strained. And so through the first couple of passages, we discover that the people of God are essentially giving God their leftovers in their sacrifice. They're giving him blemished sacrifices. They're not giving the male goat that's required according to Old Testament. They're kind of passing off maybe a goat that has a broken leg or maybe one that isn't sort of the cream of the crop or their first fruit and saying, okay, well, let's do this. And then we see quite pointedly that God says, look, if you continue to do this, I'm going to wipe the animal dung on your face. Now, in that, what we remember is that in the sacrifice, as the animal was cleaned, just like when we are hunting, the animal would be gutted and the innards of the animal would be removed. They were considered unclean. And then they would be taken and they would be removed from the sacrifice out essentially to the trash heap that was away from the altar. Excuse me, away from the altar. What God is saying is, look, if you keep doing this, I'm going to take essentially those portions and wipe it on your face as a mark to show that you are giving me your leftovers. And then we come to discover that another issue is, is that individuals are marrying foreign wives and they're doing so unlawfully. They're essentially breaking the law to get out of the marriage that they are in, and then they're breaking the law again to get into a marriage that is unlawful. And now God confronts the people one more time, and that's where we are today. And he says, look... I'm here to tell you that you're robbing me. 
And people kind of look and they say, well, God, how are we robbing you? We're, you know, we're not robbing you. We're not taking from you. We're not coming and stealing from you. And God says, yes, you are. And the people kind of look around and they say, well, how are we robbing you? And he says, quite pointedly, in your tithes and offerings. Right there, in your tithes and offerings. And now the people of God kind of look and they say, well, wait a minute. What's, what's that big of a deal? And God says, look, all I'm asking of you is to give, you a, uh, give a portion of what I give to you back to the work of God. All I'm asking is a part of what I provide for you. And we're going to get into the detail in that in just a minute. And you're not doing so. And so he says, look, I'm asking that you return to me and I will return to you. It is a conditional aspect. There is an aspect, brothers and sisters in Christ, that God looks upon the heart of how we give to him. And the bottom line in this, as we get into some of the details that I want to encourage you in, at the end of the day, I'll give you some specifics. I'll give you some things to think about. We'll talk about it biblically. I'll encourage you in your tithes and offerings. But at the end of the day, it's really your heart before God. It's just the bottom line. And so here's what I want to tell you, just kind of jokingly, as we've seen in some of these videos, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you can look good, you can manipulate, you can hide, you can praise yourself, you can whatever. All of those different kind of caricatures that we saw on the video. Um, you, can, you can, you know, for lack of a better word, fool me. I, I mean, I can easily be fooled, right? But God knows your heart. The other quick thing that I want to let you know is I don't see individual giving. I don't want to. I never will. I do see reports on a weekly basis of what's come in, just so I know where we are financially, but I don't see who gives individually, and there's a big reason for that. Number one, um, I don't want to know. Number two, um, I don't want to see somebody that's a big giver, right, and then be sort of manipulated by them or appease them because I'm sitting there and I'm going, well, gosh, you know, if they get upset or something like that, we might get, not get enough money, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So the bottom line in that is I don't know. Neither does Keith. But in this, the matter of the heart is really what God is after. And so, yes, this morning we're having a sermon on tithing. I know it's not your favorite, um, but it's a necessary part of our walk with Jesus Christ. And one of the things that I want to encourage you in is there are a lot of ways that we can show our heart for God. There are a lot of ways that we can demonstrate our commitment to him. But my word of encouragement is, is one of the greatest ways that we can really show our heart to God is how we tithe to him. How we look and how we go about giving back to the Lord's work. And so this morning, again, we're going to be diving into the latter part of Malachi chapter 3, verses 6 through 8. And we're going to ask this question. It's a very obvious one, but it's this. Uh, where are our hearts with respect to our tithe and offerings to God? And I want to take a minute, and there's no judgment here. Uh, there's no, wow, look at this, or you got to do that. But I do want to encourage you to take a minute and just ask yourself this simple question. Where is my heart when it comes to tithing or giving offerings to God? And there's a couple of things that I want to throw out to you, okay? Number one is it something that is upsetting to you? Gosh, you know, oh, I, I just, you know, I come to church and, 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 and I see the offering plate go around and I see people looking and I, I just, you know, I feel like I'm compelled and I got to pull out whatever I got in my wallet and okay, I've got, I've got $50, you know, I've got a 20 and, and a couple of 10s and, and man, I really, you know, I really need to make sure that I get a hamburger later um, and then I've got this and I've got that, but ah, uh, okay, well, I guess I'll just, I'll just pull out the lowest bill just so I can throw something into the plate. So is it compulsive? Is it out of obligation? And, and lovingly, what I want to tell you is this. In God's eyes, what I would encourage you to do is not give it all. Honestly, if, if it's that kind of manner of how you're giving, lovingly, I would say, don't do it. Just keep, keep the money. Get the hamburger, right? The next thing that I want to ask is, when you come, have you sort of done it as an afterthought, right? Oh, shoot. 
Okay, I'm in church. I, I didn't even think about it. I, uh, uh, okay, I've got to just grab something and I've got to pull it out. And maybe it's somewhat cheerful. Maybe you're like, oh, okay, yeah, here's this and there it is. And then the next question, is it something that is essentially planned? And what I mean by that is as an act of worship, however you want to do it, is it something that in your financial okay, realm, whatever it might be, that you've looked ahead and you have planned and said, God, these are the first fruits that I want to give to you. This is my offering to you, and this is what I want to do out of an act of worship. And is it something that when you give, and this is the key, you say, Lord, thank you for what you have given to me. This is my offering to you. May you be glorified. And here's what I want to tell you. I'm not standing up here saying I've arrived at the perfect giving. There are days in my life where I'm sitting there and I'm going, man, things are a little tight. I could really use that money for something else. I could really take that and get a bigger X or a newer Y or a better thing of whatever. But at the end of the day, brothers and sisters, my word of encouragement is, is to remember that everything that we have, everything that we have comes from God. Now, God has given you the talent to be able to do what it is that you do. God has given you the ability to do those things. But we're stewards of the funds that God gives. And so the next question is, how are we stewarding the funds that God has given us? With that, we're going to dive into Malachi, and this is what we're going to read. We turn to uh, verse 6 of chapter 3, and it says, I, the Lord, do not change. So you, O descendants of Jacob, are not destroyed. Ever since the time of your forefathers, you have turned away from my decrees and have not kept them. Return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord Almighty. Okay? So first off, God is just saying, look, I have come, I have given, I have brought you back out of exile, I have reestablished you, I have provided for you, and I've just asked a couple of things of you. But ever since then, what you're doing is, is you're turning away from them. You're not wanting to do them. And they're not demanding they're there to draw you closer to me. They're there to draw your heart in a deeper reverence of who I am. But you've changed them. You've manipulated them. You've cheated them. And God says this. Return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord Almighty. Now, it's interesting because that is conditional. And sometimes we kind of feel like, well, maybe is that, is that God kind of manipulating and saying things? The bottom line is, is God is saying, look, I have come and I've provided for you. You have to see that in the establishment of what's being said here. God has said and done and proven his faithfulness to the people of God over and over and over and over. And the people of God have kind of said, well, that's great, but we don't really want to follow what it is that you're asking of us. We want all the blessing. We want all the benefits but we don't really want to worship you in how you have asked us to do so. And then interesting enough, what we've discovered is because their hearts are distant from God, they're not getting what they want, and then they turn and they blame God because they're not getting what they want, even though their hearts aren't for God. And so the other thing that I want to just encourage you in is this. Check your heart with God. God. Are you upset with him? Are you saying, God, you're not giving me what I want, how I want, and where I want it? And perhaps maybe what we need to do is examine our hearts and say, well, maybe it's because our hearts are very distant from him. Maybe we come and we demand God to give us blessing. But when God asks us to give back to him, we don't want anything to do with that. Or we give out of compulsion. Or we give out of frustration. Or we give out of manipulation or whatever it might be. Then he continues on, and it says, but you ask, how are we to return? Okay, so it's an interesting, this isn't, one of the things that I think is, is, is so important to see this, 
it sounds good on the outside, right? It could be like, oh my gosh, like how are we to return? Oh, we, right? No, this is manipulative. This is trying to look good on the outside with zero heart really to do so, right? And then God just basically cuts right to the chase. And he says, will a man rob God? Yet you rob me. Oh, how do we rob you? And they know. <laughs> they know. Like, how do, how, how do we rob? Oh, wait, we're here. We're, we're going through the motions. We, we look good on the outside. How do we rob you? And then God just lays it right out in your tithes and your offerings. Boom, it's right there. Bing. Okay? We're just going to cut right to it. We're going to get to the issue. We're going to just speak it right out. We're going to tell the truth in your tithes and your offerings. You are under a curse, the whole nation of you, because you are robbing me. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty. And the gates of heaven will pour out so much blessing that you will not have room enough for it. I will prevent pests from devouring your crops, and the vines of your fields will not cast their fruits, says the Lord Almighty. Then all the nations will call you blessed, for yours will be a delightful land, says the Lord Almighty. You have said harsh things against me, says the Lord, yet you ask, what have we said against you? You have said it is futile to serve God. What did we gain by carrying out his requirements and going about like mourners before the Lord Almighty? So here's another portion that God is saying. I've provided, I've given, I've blessed. And you've gone your own way. And you've done your own thing. And you've cheated me in a variety of different areas. Because your hearts are far from me. And now... You're telling me, or you're going to other people saying, you know what, I'm serving God, I'm doing my thing, and it's, it's futile. I mean, it, it, you know, he just, he's not really there. He doesn't really do a whole lot. Look at my life, et cetera, et cetera. And the whole time has got us sitting there saying, I am here. I have provided for you. I have done what I can for you. But your heart is far from me. And now you're telling me that it's futile to serve do you see the heart of the people here? They look great on the outside, but their hearts are very, very far from God on the inside. Verse 14, it says, you have said it is futile to serve God. What did we gain by carrying out his requirements and going about like mourners before the Lord Almighty? But now... We call the arrogant blessed. Certainly the evildoers prosper, and even those who challenge God escape. Real fast, be very careful how you look at blessing on a temporal basis. Because if you look at blessing on a temporal basis, you can become frustrated with God when you forget how he has blessed us on a spiritual level. What do I mean by that? There are a lot of people out there who are very far from God and their lives financially are going way better than a lot of our lives. And sometimes we can look at that and we can say, well, gosh, look at them. They don't even know God and look at how great they are. They just took a big trip to Tahiti. They just got the bigger house. They just got the newer car. They just got the second condo in the ski area or whatever it might be. Why should I continue to serve God? And at times, that can cause us to become frustrated with him all the time, forgetting that God has blessed us in the manner that we are redeemed, that we are his children, that our inheritance is secure, that we are destined for his kingdom, that we are called a blessed son or a daughter of the living king, and that we need no longer fear sin nor death. And that's how we are blessed. Continues on and it says, Then those who fear the Lord talked with each other, and the Lord listened and heard. A scroll of remembrance was written in his presence concerning those who feared the Lord and honored his name. Finally, people are starting to get it. 
Finally, people are starting to say, you know what, you're right, God. Our hearts are very far from you. They will be mine, says the Lord Almighty. In the day I will make up my treasured possession. I will spare them, just as in compassion a man spares his son who serves him. And you will again see the distinction between the righteous and the wicked, between those who serve God and those who do not. Brothers and sisters, at the end of the day, God will take up, for lack of a better word, collection, and he will spare the righteous. And what a blessing that is because of the joy that we share in Jesus Christ. But we also have to remember that in our time as we walk with God, we need to check our heart and ask ourselves, are we close to him or are we far from him? So the first thing that I want to show you in this passage is essentially in the first six verses, and that is simply this that we're to stop robbing God and test him with our tithe. Now that's, that's up to you personally, okay? This is just, this is what God is saying, okay? Some of you might be sitting there saying, you know, I'm doing what I need to do and I feel that I'm fine with my tithe and that's fine. Others of you might be sitting there saying, gosh, I don't, I don't even know what this is all about. Well, let's talk through this for a minute. The first thing that I want to show you is that we are called to give a tithe or an offering to God. Again, I'm just going to share with you, okay, this is not a comment on our church. I'm just going to give you some statistics. But generally speaking, the average American church goer gives about 2.5 to 3% of their income in a tithe. Okay? Just, that's not bad. I'm not going to say it's, you know, great. You know, giving, that's wonderful. Okay? However, we're going to see in just a moment that the word tithe here is an offering, and that was 10% of your earnings. I'll talk about that in just a minute. But this is something that I think should be convicting to all of us to think about and pray about. And that's, this, is, this is the following statement. This comes from Empty Tomb Research in Champaign, Illinois. A team of researchers from Empty Tomb Incorporated in Champaign, Illinois, have tracked Christian American expenditures along with global needs for the last several years. In their estimation, $70 to $80 billion a year could meet the most essential human needs around the world. Okay, so think about that for a minute. 70 to $80 billion a year could meet the most essential human needs around the world. Clean water, sanitation, infant child health care, basic education, and immunization slash food and shelter. That number sounds like a lot, doesn't it? However, this is what also researchers have found. If church members of the U.S. would increase their giving to 10% of their income, there would be an an additional $86 billion available for overseas missions. That's just fact. It's not a statement to all of you. I'm just talking statistically over the American church. Ten percent. God says, they do not change, so you, O descendants of Jacob, are not destroyed. Ever since... The time of your forefathers, you have turned away from my decrees and have not kept them. Return to me and I will return to you, says the Lord Almighty. It doesn't take very long to look around and recognize that we are one of, if not the most blessed nation financially in the world. And what I'm going to just throw out to all of us is what are we doing with it? When I, when I look at that, and I recognize that, my goodness, if we were to really move forward and have a heart for God, so many of the global issues that are out there could be greatly helped or potentially eradicated. It's very convicting to me. And I just leave it to all of us. The next thing that we see is, again, I've said... That the people say, you know, how, how, are we, how are we robbing you? And then God says, in your tithes and offerings. Okay? And then the people are essentially under a curse. During this time, they were essentially experiencing a drought. And God is saying, look, 
if you give your first fruits, you'll no longer will experience a drought. It's conditional. Now, when we see this in your tithes and offerings, all right, the verb there in Hebrew, okay, or sorry, the word in Hebrew, tithe, is amaser, all right? And essentially, that word is a tenth or 10% of one's produce off the land or income. It's there. Now, I'm going to just say, yes, under the Mosaic Law, this is part of what the people of God were called to give. If individuals want to, you can and make an argument, and that's fine, that we're no longer under the Mosaic Law, and you would be completely right. I will not argue with you on that. But the next question that I would ask is, if you're arguing that, then really where is your heart to give to God? Now, interestingly enough, how many of you are familiar with Dave Ramsey? Anybody familiar with Dave Ramsey? Anybody gone through Financial Peace University? We kind of know that. Okay, so this is what he says. A tithe is a portion, 10% of your income, given as an offering to your local church. Okay. I, yeah, I'm not going to disagree with Dave. All right. Here's what I'm going to tell you. Um, if you're giving 10% of your income and perhaps, I don't know, 5% of it's coming to Faith Bible Church and 5% is going to another mission or whatever, great. Praise God for it. What I would encourage, not demand, I'm just going to encourage, is that in your offering, whatever percentage it is, that the greater percentage of what you're giving would go to the local church of which you are a member. Make sense? Okay, I mean, that's just part you're, you're, you're participating. Not demanding it, not gonna be legalistic, I'm just gonna suggest that. Fun fact, the word tithe literally means tenth in Hebrew. Because the custom of tithing is biblical, many Christians and Jews practice it as a part of their faith. Leviticus 27.30 Okay, and the TLB says, a tenth of the produce of the land, whether in grain or fruit, is the Lord and is holy. And Proverbs 3 9 says, honor the Lord with your wealth, the first, uh, the first fruits of all your crops. Okay, so in this, one of the things that I would just encourage, that I would just suggest, is to look at how God has set you up financially. And then to begin to say, Lord, how can I move forward to an act of worship, which is biblical tithing? How do you get there? All right. Um, here's a couple of encouragements to you. All right. This is what I'm just going to tell you what we do. Um, and I'm doing so. I'm doing so very just matter of fact, humbly. This isn't like, oh, wow, look at us. OK, um, because I will admit to you. Um, there are days when I look at our like financial spreadsheet and I'm going, man, if I just dropped my tithe by about this, I could get more of that. I, I'm, I, I'm tempted. Okay. But what we do, and this is just how for me and for my family, it puts our tithe in an honoring position for God is this. At the end of the year, we look and basically we run a spreadsheet of our income and then we put our expenditures in, okay? But before we do, the first thing that we do is, is we look and we put in our tithe and we put it at 10%, okay? Sometimes we put it a little bit more, like, I'm just, I'm being transparent. And it's there and it's done and it's, that's what's gonna happen and that's gonna go to God. And then, I've said before, sometimes I forget, so you can you know, watch me over here, but generally speaking, the first Sunday of the month is for us personally when we give that tithe. And I'm not saying that that's how you have to do it. You can give weekly, you can give you know, bi-weekly, you can give once, however you want to do it personally, that's fine. But for us, the reason that we do that is that is an act of our first fruit. Okay, that's just for us personally. What I mean by that is, hey, this is gonna go out, no matter what, as an act of worship to God, freely, depending on no matter what happens over the next month, right? It's not something where it's, 
hey, I'm going to look and I'm going to do everything that I want and I'm going to buy everything that I need and I'm going to take care of all of the things that are out there and then when I'm done, okay, then I'm going to see what's left in the pot and give that to God. That's not first fruit. And, and I'm not... I know this is a hard subject, but I'm being very honest. It's not a first fruit when it's what's left over. A first fruit is, here it is. This is what I'm giving, and now I'm going to depend and trust and live on what is left. And then, the next part is this. I get challenged on this as well. Because sometimes, sure, I'll give, but I've told you before, my heart's a little reluctant. I'm like, man, you know, I wonder if everybody else is doing what I mean. Maybe I could just put it down a little bit. You know, I, you know gosh, everybody says the statistic is 2.5 or 3%. Maybe I could just drop it a little bit, right? And, and, then, <laughs> and then I get convicted by the following. 2 Corinthians 9, verses 6 and 7. Remember this. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each man should give what he has decided in his heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And here's, here's where I'll go with this. I would suggest, yes, this says each man or each woman, anyone, right, should decide in their heart what they should give. Well, that means that if I want to give, you know, this, less than 10%, that's fine. I would argue lovingly, no, a tithe is 10%, but you can also give more. If you want to give 50% of your income, then give 50% of your income. And please hear me on this, okay? God is not going to elevate you more than somebody else because you're giving more than someone. That is not what is being said here. But if in your giving, God has this compulsion or you have this moving of the Holy Spirit where you're sitting there and you're like, man, you know, um, I've been blessed. It's been a good year or, you know, here's this or whatever. I feel like I'm called to give more than do. And do so with a cheerful heart. And the other thing too, notice where it says not reluctant, excuse me, not reluctantly or under compulsion. Okay? Um, my, my strong word of encouragement to you when you give is to give with joy. To give with a heart that says, you know what, God, thank you for what you have given. Thank you for how you've provided for me. I want to give as a heart offering to you. And also, don't do so under compulsion. I've said that before. Okay? If you're sitting there and you're thinking, gosh, I don't want to give and I feel like I should. I feel like everybody's watching, et cetera, et cetera. Honestly, don't give. Okay? We don't want to manipulate or make you feel like, oh, I got to give because they're watching. No. Give because your heart is for God. Now, um, in this, in this kind of area, the ESV says this, God is challenging the people to give the tithe that they owed him and then watch to see if he would be faithful to his promise. God promises to meet all their needs. Okay, so hear this. God promises to meet all of their needs, but I love what they say next. But not necessarily all of their greeds. That's, that is so, like, great. God promises to meet all of your needs, but not necessarily all of your greeds. And to pour down for you a blessing until there is no more need. God then continues on and he says, essentially, test me in this. Bring what? The whole tithe into the storehouse. Bring the whole 10% into the storehouse. And I will bless. Test me. Now, the next thing that I want to encourage you in is, 
How many of you have ever gone through a month where you're looking and on the spreadsheet things don't add up? Okay? And I'll tell you, I'll, I will be 100% honest, my first gut instinct, because I am still a sinner in need of a savior, is I'll just decrease my tithe. And then all of a sudden it's like, you know, not, this isn't theologically, but, but like, a little angel here, a little, hey, you need a tithe. No, you don't. You need a tithe. No, you don't, right? And all of a sudden I'm like, okay, God, yeah, you're right. And then I move away from the compulsion to the joy and say, you know what, God, you have and you continue to faithfully provide for me and my family. You have demonstrated that for years. Thank you even though knowing that in my head the spreadsheet isn't adding up. And here's what's funny, okay? I love this, the investment giver, and we're going to talk about that in a minute. This is not the investment giver. I don't want you thinking, okay, if I start to increase my tithes, right, God's going to make me super wealthy. Where's the heart in that? Are you really giving to God? No, you're giving because you want to become wealthy, right? But time and time again, in those moments where I have looked and I'm going, it isn't going to add up, but I honor God with the first fruit. In these weird ways that only God can do, what I thought might be needed as an expense isn't. So the bill that I thought was maybe $50, it turns out that it's only 30. Or... The next thing you know, oh, hey, guess what? Here's a rebate on this, and we want to give you back. Why? And these just weird little ways, God figures it out. And we're okay. And he meets our needs. And the other side of it, too, is there are times when I'm looking and I'm upset because I want God to meet my greed. God, I really want that new X, right? Right? But if I'm going to give to you, I can't get that X. And I need it. And now all of a sudden I look in my life and I'm like, no, I'm greeting it. You've met my needs. I'm walking in greed. And may I give back to you. Brothers and sisters, we're to stop robbing God and test him with our tithe. He continues on and he says essentially in verse 12, Then all the nations will call you blessed, for yours will be delightful land, says the Lord Almighty. Uh, I wonder what it would be like If all of a sudden, on all of the major news headlines, there was this headline that says, global hunger is eradicated. Basic needs of human people have been met and dignity to the human condition has been restored. Done by the church for Jesus Christ. It's futile. It'll never happen. God will never bless. God will never do anything. Really, is that going to happen? You have said harsh things against me, verse 13, says the Lord. Yet you ask, what have we said against you? You have said it's futile to serve God. What did we gain by carrying out his requirements and going about like the mourners before the Lord Almighty? Now we call the arrogant blessed. Certainly the evildoers prosper, and even those who challenge God escape. Man, I've got friends out there. They're driving awesome cars. They're getting bigger houses. They're doing this thing. And man, I could have a nicer car, but I got a tithe today. It's futile. Do you see the heart that's being displayed by the people here? 
And so lovingly, essentially, the next thing that we see in verses 13 through 15 is this question, this fundamental question that I think all of us ask at some point in our lives. And isn't the idea futile of testing God with our tithe? Because when we look around, the people who don't even know God seem to be doing better than we are. What's the point? And then we continue on and it says, essentially, Verse 16, then those who fear the Lord talked with each other, and the Lord listened and heard. There's a change of heart. But before we get there, I want to take a minute, and, and this, uh, this is an idea. A lot of people look and they say 10%, okay? A couple of, couple of words of encouragement to you. Um, we're coming on the end of the year. You know, I don't know, you don't have to, I don't want to know your finances, I don't know how you manage your finances, but maybe a word of encouragement is that you as a family, you as, as husband and wife, sit down and, and look. Or you as an individual look. And you say, look, this is what I know God is, is, is bringing in. Okay? For some of you, I get it. Your income might vary. You might be in sales. It might be you know, this, that, or the other thing. It might not be guaranteed. I get that. I would look, and maybe what I would encourage you to do is, is to, to look at an average, maybe go back and say, okay, you know, this year was this, this year was this, this year was this, but as I average out these years, this is the average that I see, and then pull 10%. And then if life is good, then maybe give a little more. I don't know. That's between you and God. But to sit down and to really look at it and say, okay, God, for next year, how can I move in my tithes and offerings? The next thing that I would say is maybe, maybe you're looking and you're going, gosh, 10% is tough. I would lovingly encourage you to see what you can do to get there. But brothers and sisters, looking with the heart is what God is after. And making it a priority in your giving is what God is looking at. And this is the other thing that, that I'm going to humorously put out, but also I think it is somewhat convicting, and that is simply this. Felix Lorenz Jr. in Holy Humor says this, when we eat out, right, most of us expect to tip the waiter or waitress 15%. Now this is old because now I'm starting to see 20, 22, 25, right? However, when we suggest 10% is a minimum church offering, some folks are aghast. I'm just going to throw that out there. I mean, we, we tip 15, 20, 22%. But when the church is saying we're asking for 10, we become upset. And then we move to verse 16. Then those who feared the Lord talked with each other, and the Lord listened and heard. A scroll of remembrance was written in his presence concerning those who feared the Lord and honored his name. They will be mine, period. No question, okay? It's interesting because it's they will future but conditional now. They are, but they will be mine. Says the Lord Almighty, in the day when I make up my treasured possession, I will spare them just as in compassion a man who spares his son and who serves him. And you will again see the distinction between the righteous and the wicked, between those who serve God and those who did not. So there is a day that is coming when God will bring his people to glory. And there will be a day of accountability. And so the final thing that I want to say is this. We've asked the question of where are our hearts with respect to our tithes and offerings to God. And we've seen that we're to stop robbing God and test him with our tithe. We're also seeing and, and asking this question, isn't the idea futile of testing God with our tithe? And the answer really comes in verse 16 and on. And that is this, no. It's not. It's not futile. It might appear to be today. 
Because God is compassionate and gracious to those who are obedient. I promise you that God will be compassionate and obedient to you. Please hear me. He will not give you all of your greeds, but he will definitely meet all of your needs. And so with this, I'm going to just throw out a heart check to all of it. When it comes to tithing to the church, where is your heart? And I just, you, you, you answer this for yourself. Is it a priority? A first fruit? Or is it an afterthought? And done or potentially done in reluctance. Oh shoot, I gotta give. Or oh gosh, you know, I don't want people to see me not give in a in a plate. Ugh, darn. And here's what I would, would ask you to do, okay? If it is a first fruit, the one thing that I want you to check your heart on is rather than saying, Yep, it's a first fruit and I'm good to go, is to go to God and say, God, is there anything that you're asking me to do more? He might say, you're fine, okay? That's between you and him. Or God may bless you. Might, God might say, hey, you know, you've had a really good year this year. And maybe that's between you and God, but God loves a cheerful giver. But if your heart is more on the afterthought or done in reluctance, I would encourage you to look and say, how can I move to make it more of a first fruit worship experience? And that is simply... Perhaps looking at your finances and saying, how, God, can I put this to the forefront of my life, the forefront of my economy, for lack of a better word? So, finally, with this, the take-home truth, okay? Essentially, what God is talking about and what God is really encouraging all of us in our hearts is this, that we should not rob God with our tithe. Rather, we should trust and test his faithfulness to us with it. Trust and test his faithfulness. Please hear me, don't use him, okay, as that investment guy was. Don't sit there and say, all right, well, you know, if I give more to God, I'm expecting that I'm going to get more. But I will tell you that in my experience in tithing, every time that I have had to test him in his faithfulness, he has always met our need. Because God is faithful, and God is gracious, and God is good. Let's pray. Father, uh, we do come before you today, and uh, it is an important part of our walk with you. Um, it is not a, a necessarily a fun sermon um, to talk about finances, to talk about our tithes and our offerings, but it is a necessary one. It is an aspect where we really check our heart before you. And so in that, Lord, I pray uh, that as we leave today, the Holy Spirit would just encourage us to really look and examine our walk before you. Father, remind us that you care for us. Remind us that you love us. Remind us of your faithfulness to us. What I love about this fact is that uh, God is, is, is not saying I'm done with you. He's saying I'm upset with you. And there are challenges and problems because your heart is not holy for me but I'm still there and I still care and I will still be with you and I will still send my son to deliver you and I will still give you my best because I love you. And so in that, Lord, no matter where we might be in this understanding or movement of our biblical tithe, I pray, Lord, that we would not feel guilty per se or unloved, but rather we would check our heart and that in that, as we look to you and the love that you give, that our desire would be to display our love to you because of how you have loved us. And that when we give, it would be out of love and worship rather than compulsion, competitiveness, obligation, or duty. And Father, may the Holy Spirit be the one that encourages our heart, draws us to you, and Lord, when we give, may we give cheerfully, bringing glory and honor to your name. We thank you. We love you. We pray these things in your name, dear Jesus. We ask it by the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit. And all God's people say, amen.